Hitting revenue targets is hard and requires constant hustle. Last quarter's success is already forgotten. Learn the mindset and tactics of today's most successful revenue producers in B2B marketing and sales. We call this the revenue hustle. I'm your host, Tom Hessen, navigating you on this journey. Today's show is sponsored by Nine Lenses, an interactive assessment platform that enables you to add instant value to your buyers and allows your sales team to tailor business conversations focused on the pain points each and every time. Check them out at NineLenses.com. Well, Revenue Hustle, I've got a wonderful guest in Mallory Lee, the Vice President of Revenue Operations at Terminus. Mallory, thank you so much for coming on to the Revenue Hustle. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you. You know, revenue operations is a space um, that has evolved. And I must say, for those of you that can't see Mallory on her video, she has got a hustle sign in her background. So um, (laughs) just another reason why she's a great guest for the revenue hustle. But um, well, um, so as I mentioned, Mallory, you're the VP of revenue operations at Terminus. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your role and Terminus. Yeah, thank you. The sign was not planned, by the way, but appreciate the um, the synergy there. I joined Terminus about two and a half years ago and lead our revenue operations team. So for us, that encompasses many departments of the business. We have dedicated operations for marketing ops, customer success ops, and also sales ops, of course. Uh, so we have RevOps proper, where we have business partners out into the departments for those functions. And then we also have um, BI analysis arm and tech management as well. Wow. So yep. all those pieces together, we're working on that revenue engine, keeping all of the strategy and process aligned and um, breaking down silos, if you will. So it's been a great experience so far. And Terminus is an ABM platform first and foremost. Um, We've got more native channels to help you do an account-based approach for a lot of your marketing, uh, generating that first party data along the way to do better targeting and better communication with your target accounts. Awesome, yes, and it must be interesting being in your role within a kind of a marketing platform, you know, that's driving revenue, right? So you guys must um, take a lot of what you do and, and, and share it elsewhere. Um, which I'm sure we'll get into. But uh, you guys know here in the Revenue Hustle, we do these things called revenue rules. And so Mallory, go ahead, give us your first revenue rule. My first revenue rule is that for marketing, I think qualified leads still very much matter. Yes, they do. Tell us more. Yeah, so what I mean by that is we've seen a pretty big shift in the market to having leaders of marketing very focused on revenue metrics. And we've gotten away from some of the vanity metrics like clicks and views and things that skyrocket. And we've become more focused on pipeline generation, revenue contribution, influencing opportunities, improving velocity. So what that means is that marketers have got a lot more focused on the bottom line and how they impact it. In my opinion, that's fantastic because you're creating better alignment with sales. You're focused on the same thing. The CMO has a seat at that revenue table. So it's been a really positive change. Um, And something that I've been doing for a lot of my career is helping marketers men like measure all of those things. Um, But I think there's a potential side effect of this in which Mm. we focus so much on revenue that we forget the path to get to the revenue. And everything is still coming in through this funnel where you're taking the top level demand and finding ways to efficiently push it down the funnel to becoming a customer. So my goal is to help people realize that, yes, opportunities and revenue are the most important thing, but they don't just appear out of nowhere. They have to start at the top and work their way through. So the more efficiently we can do that, the better that we can get predictable outcomes from our demand gen programs. And once we have a really efficient operation going on, you can more confidently pour money into the top to get more volume to really grow. 
Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I'm curious to know how you kind of came to that because you know I've seen it too. You see it on LinkedIn, and just a lot of the marketing community was all about those vanity metrics at the beginning, right? Oh, look at all the clicks yeah. and the likes and the, and you know they were you know let's say compensated or gold on those vanity metrics, which was a big misalignment to sales, right? And so you're saying like this big shift to sales revenue, right? That alignment was an overall positive thing. But now you're like swinging the pendulum back just a little bit to say, hey, but don't forget, right? So how did you like, how do you see that, right? Like, so what, what brought you to that sort of, um, you know, the cost, as you will, as you mentioned, like what, how do you see that in the business or with clients? Yeah, I think there's always a little bit of a pendulum, right? And right. it happens with a lot of different things. Um, but really, I think it's just from personal experience, places I've worked or companies I've done consulting with where we've you know, achieved great results on pipeline generation. And so you're maybe getting bigger deal sizes, you're hitting those pipeline targets, but then you get to next quarter and you have this gap and you're like, well, why do we have a gap if we hit our pipeline goal? And so you start to break down the problem and what you can pretty soon find is that having the same number of opportunities that are worth more, that helps you hit a dollar figure number that you're working with. But if your number of deals is consistently staying the same and not growing the number of leads, number of opportunities, then you're still not getting that meaningful growth into the funnel. And so with a series of teams, I've helped them kind of break down why aren't we growing? And I think that's one of it, that's been one of the most common denominators is that even if you hit that pipeline target, you still have to pay attention to the number of opportunities because you're looking for those to fill next quarter's funnel, continue to accelerate that velocity and get out ahead of where you've been. And, and so for marketers, is it, are you saying like they're like, I don't want to say taking their eye off the ball at the top of the funnel, but they're so overly focused on middle and bottom of the marketing funnel that less time, effort, dollars, you know, is that what's happening? That they're putting less time, money, effort at the top of the funnel just to get more into the, into the top? Exactly. If we are so focused on one particular channel that gives us our biggest deals, right? Because we're seeing the best efficiency, best conversion, most close one new business from that one channel. It's the right thing to do to build that into the way that we run our budget. But if you're too focused on that one thing, that one channel reaches some kind of diminishing return and you're cutting off volume in other places. So just like anything else, I think it's a balance. We have to still look for that leading indicator at the top line of volume growth. Um, but if the funnel that we're crafting has become more efficient along the way, then everything kind of hums together and I think works better. And so it, I guess, you know, because marketers are, you know, especially as you grow, right? Like that first channel that you want to optimize, that's great, right? Because that's, that's, that's your bread and butter. But what I'm hearing you saying is you also have to be experimenting with other channels to find new growth avenues or you're just going to, hit a wall with that one channel and your growth will stop because you've, you know, it, it's, it's hit its ceiling, right? Is that what you're saying? Like marketers need to be also thinking about the other channels and experimenting and, and is that what that looks like? I think so for sure, because there are some channels where you can pour in more and more and more money and predictably get more results. And then some of them do plateau. So I agree with where you're taking this and, there's an article I'm obsessed with. I'll get you the link. It's it's all about the it. elephant I, I, curve. I, I read that. I I, I will yeah. tell you. So your stuff that you share, people do read. I I saw that about uh, the <laughs> hockey stick growth. I'm sorry, I didn't want to jump in, but I, I go yeah. ahead. I'll let you explain it. No, you're right. It's just this concept of all campaigns or all channels having, you know, quick growth acceleration at the beginning, and then they do plateau. So the way to overcome the plateau is to layer them on top. And so you're always accelerating and each campaign or channel has its lifetime. Um, but experimentation is a great way to do that. And I've always loved the idea of taking a marketing budget and segmenting it that way. I'm going to put 65% into my known proven. These are the bread and butter. I'm going to take, you know, 
10%, 15% for branding. And then I've got my experimentation budget, which is set aside for things that are a test. We have no idea if they're going to work, but if they do work, how great is that? You found a new thing you can unlock. Yeah, the layering I thought was really interesting and the, the misnomer of the exponential growth. I think that was the same article mm -hmm. where there, you know, this, um, I think it was a, a gentleman who had written saying exponential growth, which is what we're all after, right, in enterprise SaaS, you know, VCs, et cetera, is not really exponential, right? It's it's more linear. And, he, you know, he breaks it down about how you, uh, even the fastest growing companies, in Facebook included, we're not exponential, you know, from a math standpoint. It's it's linear, and takes that back into marketing. So no, sh sh yeah, send me that link again. And I'll I'll put it in the show notes for everyone. But it really is a great uh, visual too of of kind of layering these campaigns on top of one another. Um, now at Terminus, like they they mentioned in that article, like HubSpot was doing it with different like modules, right? So like they would go out with this, you know, their base platform and then they'd add a new module and there's a new campaign targeting that module. So they're just kind of building the business through new campaigns centered around these new, you know, modules of functionality. Yeah, and I think you can expand that just to the macro business strategy of becoming a multi-product company, finding new streams of revenue. It's yeah. really the same thing. So markets get saturated, you need to expand to a new market to layer that growth right on top very similar idea to how you can continue to grow marketing. No, no, that's great. And so as it relates to this um, kind of swinging back from overly focused or is it not 100% focused on the revenue, like how has that conversation gone internally? Let's just say, um, you know, do people look at you like, well, wait a second, we just spent the last five years focused on marketing and revenue. Um, we're revenue marketers, right? All this sort of language, <clears throat> like, how does that play internally when you're just talking about, hey, but don't forget? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it takes some practice. Um, it's something that I have been talking about for quite a while. I think with Terminus, we've been on our own kind of special journey because we are an account-based company. And we do firmly believe that the most efficient way to go to market is to identify those target accounts and then work your way back. Let's focus on the customers we want to go get because we know that they match our ideal profile. They're gonna be more successful with us. And so there was a period of time, you know, just super candidly with Terminus where they were kind of against leads. And um, so it's counterintuitive in some ways for me to come in and just talk about leads, which is funny. But where I choose to focus is on the right leads, right? right? It's not just any lead, it's the qualified ones. And so we measure something really specific at Terminus now called a qualified conversion. And what this is, it's identifying leads that are choosing to come in, you know, the website or come into us, but they auto match to a previously targeted qualified account that we've been doing account-based advertising to an outbound calling to, an outbound marketing. And when you get those target accounts coming inbound, to me, that's the holy grail because right. you're seeing outbound and inbound combine. You're seeing the payoff of the branding and the air cover that account-based ads can provide. And you're more efficiently capturing that name because they're choosing to come in the door at the same time that you've been targeting them. So those are the ones that we really focus on, the qualified conversions. And it could be a brand new lead that becomes an opportunity that you've never even seen, or it can be those leads that are pre-qualified and we automatically route them to the account owner so that we can quickly get them into the opportunity funnel. No, that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's an interesting point because right, you spend all this time outbound and you want someone to just to respond to an email and say, yes, I'll book a meeting, right? Or, um, but you know, all of that effort leading to an inbound is is a combination of both the sales and marketing activities you know together producing that i would assume a very conversation ready um you know lead right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. awesome um no that's I, I appreciate you sharing that too about terminus because i think that's it's interesting just how these concepts are applied right i mean you know on these podcasts people come on and talk about these different ideas but it, how it gets implemented within each of their companies and how it's talked about within marketing and and how people view these sorts of things um 
you know, vary. And it sounds like, like, tell me a little bit about like your sales and marketing leadership in terms of like how the culture there is supporting kind of some of the views that you're talking about there, or this journey that you've been on. Um, like how does, how does the leadership team think about growth and, and sales and marketing playing together? Yeah, I would say we're always working on that alignment, right? Because, we very much want to help the sales reps understand how we're supporting them. We support them in a variety of ways. And our marketing team, of course, is using our own platform to the fullest. So we need to have the right ways to show them how that's going. Um, we deem ourselves as kind of customer zero, right? So yeah. the challenges that we experience with showing the value of what we're doing, we feed that right into feedback for product and feedback for our leadership teams so that they understand what our customers are experiencing. And um, it's a newer concept to try to really distill this merging of inbound and outbound. And, you know, the Topo team, they've got their dual funnel idea, the double funnel, where you have inbound and outbound funnels that end up in the same place. And I think a lot of people are starting to embrace that. And this is just kind of my take on how we would measure it. So I'm lucky to be in a seat where I get to decide many of the things that I do put in front of our executive team. And I get to kind of chart the course for what I'd like for them to focus on. Um, and so I think it's working. You know, we're focused on that. We're looking at the conversion more than almost anything. So mm -hmm. that's another aspect that I feel super strongly about is that getting a more efficient funnel where things can move through faster and stronger and you get more outcome by just taking that existing traffic or those existing leads and getting more of them to convert. That's such a strong play for a startup or a scale up because you're trying to grow as fast as possible without completely overspending on every single resource. Right. So it's gone well. It's something that's a new muscle and, um, you know, as simple as putting it on dashboards and putting it in front of people, they start to get used to seeing it and they want to understand how it works and, so it's always an evolution. And where do you sit within the sales and marketing kind of organizations? Are you in marketing, even though you're servicing both? Good question. I don't sit in marketing. So I report to our COO, basically um, our president and COO. So we're des definitely like department agnostic, we say. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I reported to our CFO for a long time as well. So not in sales, not in marketing, but really kind of trying to serve that um, right. arbiter of truth in the middle and serving all of them equally. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I can imagine that being a, you know, uh, I, I can see why you would do it that way. Because again, you're serving both organizations to their, to the fullest, right? Because you're, you know, you're serving them in, in differently, but together. Um, mm -hmm. Has it always been that way? And is that where, is that common too, that revenue operations sits outside of both of those organizations? I don't think it's that common. Um, I think a lot of times you'll see RevOps under a CRO. And that's one reason that people are hesitant to group marketing operations in with it, because they think, why would I have marketing operations reporting to the sales leader? And I do understand that there's a, a tricky situation there that you have to try to manage. That That's why I like the way that ours is centralized and more agnostic. Um, it was like that before I joined. So I've been lucky to walk into an organization where they always had it centralized. They always placed a lot of value on RevOps. And I've been, you know, lucky to benefit from that situation, of course. Yeah, I'm sure that keeps keeps um, everybody aligned and, you know, we're all playing for each other and not, um, you know, I can just imagine if, if, you know, you sat in one org versus their other, it could be like, well, you're you know, just, just more opportunity for sales and marketing to not play nicely together. Mm -hmm. um, well, good. Well, let's let's move uh, into your second revenue rule. Um, can you share about that? Yeah. So I think the wording that I put around this was something along the lines of, in operations, you need to measure what matters. And so it's related to what we've been talking about in terms of not forgetting about lead flow and volume metrics and, you know, ways to accelerate your business. Um, but then you start to ask yourself, okay, if we've identified that qualified leads are still important, then how do we focus on them the right way? 
because now we're balancing the revenue metrics and the lead metrics, and we need to understand when to look at each, I think. So the question becomes, how do you do both? And I think that if you're measuring what matters, you're able to also stratify that across the different roles of the leaders in sales and marketing and different people need to focus on different things. So am I suggesting that all CMOs need to become obsessed with lead flow? No, definitely not. Um, but I think that there are certain people within the marketing organization that should be tasked with measuring, tracking, identifying, how are the qualified leads coming in per program and managing to that so that if you have certain individual contributors or teams that are focused on the top of the funnel, and then you're kind of increasing with your level of responsibility of a marketing leader, you're increasing the focus to the revenue path. By the time you get to the CMO, that person is still highly focused on revenue contribution, customer acquisition costs, overall velocity, and board level metrics that are you know, super important to that seat at the executive table. Um, but I think that if we kind of delineate the responsibilities and help people see how their individual role contributes all the way to those top you mm -hmm. know, revenue metrics, then you're kind of taking care of all of it because somebody's focused on everything. Yeah, and how did you guys come to figure out like what is worth measuring, right? And is that kind of like a, an evolving, you know, as the business has changed, I'm sure it's not changing, you know, daily or weekly, but how do you guys think about what, what's worth measuring? I think it's always evolving. Um, but, you know, typically we find the things that matter the most when nothing's perfect, right? So if you have a problem or a slowdown or a blocker and you need to go investigate what is stuck, I think that's where you start to find typically it's a rate. You know what I mean? I think you can find the rates that are not performing where they used to be. I call it a funnel teardown, right? You just look at every step of the funnel and you look at where things are getting stuck. And so normally you'll find, oh, it's actually this really important channel that is generating a lot of leads, but they're not going anywhere. And they used to be going somewhere. So now how do we understand what changed? Um, and then you start to keep your eye on that rate because you've identified the thing that needs to get better. Right. And so you're just finding these metrics that need to come out of the woodwork. Um, I think that that's typically how I've, you know, uncovered something new in the past. Got it. And and so like on the sales side of the house, because there's like tons of data, right, in marketing where you're like, you know, you're looking at conversion rates and, and there's just so much data produced in marketing. I mean, and that's why you know, marketing operations has played such a big role. Sales operations has historically been around, you know, territories and comp plans and commissions and, and, and you know, some basic reporting. Like, how does it look on that side? And, and how do you, you know, maybe there's less data, you know, obviously there's deals and moving through stages, but like, how does it look on the sales side, you know, in terms of like what RevOps is measuring and, and, and tracking? Yeah, yeah. I think there's just as much of a funnel, honestly. Um, I think that you can draw a lot of parallels to that outbound funnel and the way that sales is, you know, contributing to the pipeline themselves, right? We've got a number of target accounts we want to get into. We can look to see how engaged they are with us. Are they responding to emails? Are they in marketing campaigns? Um, you know, with the proliferation of all the sales software out there, a rep can see their conversion rate on their outbound cold emails. Right. They can see if people are paying attention. So I think there's a prospecting funnel for sales that we want to continue to optimize. And then once you get that opportunity into the pipeline, the sales funnel begins and we can start to understand, you know, what is our acceptance rate of our first call? Are we having that first call and it's qualified and it's moving on? Are we having a qualification problem and something is getting stuck? Once you get out of that first call, it's time to do discovery. Are we converting out of discovery? And measuring the conversion from each stage is something right. that we're trying to look at more and more. And then understanding how that's varying by person or by team can help us identify what is the right way to get somebody through. Well, that, yeah, because yeah, I, I think with the sales is, is with obviously – 
you get into human performance and skills and abilities and experiences and so on. So, you know, some of it may be like the type of like the quality of lead that just comes in, right? Is it the right fit? Is it, you know, the right industry and so on? But then it's like, okay, once all those boxes are checked from kind of the lead standpoint, and then it's like, okay, individual performance or team performance based on any number of factors. And that's where I think sales gets very difficult because you're not dealing with, you know, if you've got a team of 50 salespeople, 50 different brains that think and operate, you know, somewhat differently. And, you know, I suspect that when you're going through that and you see teams or individuals performing differently than others, do you then like, I don't know if you guys have like a sales enablement function, but like it, it could be, you know, like now you're bringing in another group to kind of solve, like there's no, like what's the equivalent of a, a funnel teardown in sales, right? It's a, you know what I mean? Like there's, it's the same set of activities, but it may be more around people skills than, you know, something changed upstream and, you know, a marketing channel. That's a great point. We do have a sales enabling group. We also have a fantastic um, kind of go to market special projects partner that I have. Her name is Lindsay. I can tell you there's a lot of manual listening that has to happen and it is a more manual process to understand what are people doing to be successful and how can we replicate that? And something we've been talking a lot about lately are the idea of mutual action plans and deal rooms, right? You're starting to see a lot more software pop up for this where, you know, I want to sell something to you. I want to make sure that we're on the same page that yes, you're buying it. Here's the path to purchase. Here's the day I want to go live. Here are the steps involved. If we want to get this done on time, the simple act, I think, of someone agreeing to create that plan with you right. is a really, like, it's a strong signal that right. I intend to partner with you. Right. So that's something new that we're looking to put even more measurement around because we think it's a strong enough indicator that it's worth building metrics for. So if I can look at my funnel and understand that half of my deals at the proposal stage don't yet have a mutual action plan that's been signed off on by us and future customer, then I can inherently understand like there's a level of risk on half of these deals where we haven't gotten to that point yet. So that's going to inform like my forecasting, our next step in the sales process, there's coaching around it. So that's something that we're starting to get deeper into right now. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I can just appreciate just, um... You know, I, I come more from the sales side than I do the marketing. And, and so I'm just always learning from people like you and others um, on, on the marketing side. But I can appreciate, you know, it's it's you've got different it's a different set of challenges within sales than it is with marketing because it's it's um, people manual oriented sort of conversations and moving things through the funnel. Um, are you guys seeing anything with, you know, because of all the ABM work that you guys do? that people are more sales ready and maybe the deal cycle is shorter. I mean, it's still an enterprise sale, right? That you guys are um, taking clients through, but you know, there's a whole concept of people want to talk less to a sales rep, right? And they're doing more in marketing. Like, are you seeing any of that or, or, you know, is there any things that you're doing in sales differently because, you know, people may be ready to buy or more ready than, let's say 10 years ago, right? When they just would pick up the phone and call sales. Yeah, I don't know if I can point to anything super specific, but I know that we are very interested in trying to warm up accounts before we start having conversations with them. Sometimes that's a branding exercise and it's just mm -hmm. about getting our name out there, creating that association of like, oh yeah, I've heard of you guys before. Right. That helps a little bit on the front end with speed, but I don't know if it's going to really go so far as to change the sales process itself. Um, one thing our marketing team just released that I do really love is an independent sort of like ABM certification. So it's just a way to get educated on ABM. You're not in our sales funnel. If you go and get certified, you're just learning. And so by doing more learning up front, yeah. we're kind of giving away this education for free and it's the right thing to do because we want to evangelize for the category. But my hope is that we will also see a quicker sales cycle with those prospects that have learned it 
And with a newer category, there's sometimes just a learning curve that you're trying to get accomplished even within a sales cycle. So I'm eager to keep my eye on that campaign. It just launched maybe a few weeks ago, Mm. but we're eager to see how that can start to impact our sales funnel because if people are coming to us and they know more upfront, um, then the message will hopefully resonate a little bit faster. Oh yeah, Yeah, because I mean, sometimes you see that, you know, I'm I'm gonna oversimplify this or take it to an extreme. It's like, some of the things you read, it's almost like people are ready to, you know, just sign up, swipe their credit card for a hundred thousand dollar, you know, enterprise software without talking to a sales rep. Like obviously it's more complex than that. Right. And I don't think anyone's quite ready, but you, you know, you probably read some of the same things that, you know um, you know, people are now buying cars out of vending machines. Right. Um, right. They don't want to talk to sales reps. And I do think there is a desire, but obviously spending, you know, corporate's money, right? Um, it's a big deal. There's a lot of risk, right? Just for the person, you know, and, and and so it's not quite ready to be automated, right? Without a sales rep, there's still a lot of education. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's fewer things to think about when buying a car color and make and model and, and that sort of thing compared to like ABM software, which is a very complex topic, let alone just the software alone, right? So it's, I'm just curious yeah. to see if you guys see anything there. It doesn't sound like there's any... Um, you know, any robots coming out of, uh, you know, your sales team <laughs> soon. Not yet. <laughs> you know, but I love that you took it to the cars because I was talking to someone on my team about this yesterday and we went deep on the car analogy. And so where it makes me think, you know, you're talking about like car from a vending machine. Um, when you show up to buy a car in person, not from a vending machine, what's the thing you want to do when you walk to the lot? Like you want to drive it, right? And you're not going to go there and have a discovery call with the car salesman for a day and then come back a different day to do your test drive. You want to get the keys and you want to test it out as right, fast as you right, can. Right, right. That's the lesson to me on the sales process where people are doing their research ahead of time. They're listening to their friends. They're reading reviews. They're getting a lot of information up front. So I think the big takeaway is that by the time they get on the phone with you, they just want to see the product. They don't want to wait for three meetings before they do deep discovery and a custom demo. Like if you can't show that product at least a little bit on the first call, I think that you're doing a disservice because that's the real outcome of somebody doing that research ahead of time is that they're ready to look at it. They've got some of that social proof that they need. Now they want to look at it and envision how it's going to work in their organization. Yeah, I've had this conversation. I'm pretty passionate about like when do you demo, right? And and, and yeah. Um, yeah. it's it's not the, the the risk, right? And I grin like you have a demo. I don't know if you on your website has like a request demo or some demo button. Like there's probably not a call sales button, but it's a is it say demo request or a demo. demo? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that kind of implies that I'm going to see something on the first meeting, right? Sure Same does. on my website, right? But I will yeah. tell you, I generally don't do a demo. I mean, I may show some screenshots as part of a story or maybe even pull something up, but it's not a demo demo, right? Because I have no idea what you're interested in, what your problems are. And then all of a sudden, someone called this uh, a couple of years ago, like a harbor tour. You're just kind of cruising around the software, like, hey, here's this building and that building. And you know, like you're just checking out things around the harbor and you have no idea like what they're interested in, what their pain points are. And they don't even really know what they're looking at. Right. Because, again, like unless you really break it down, it just looks like a bunch of screens hitting them in the face and they're not equipped to understand. And so it's like I would always say, like, I don't call demos. Um, I call them solution presentations because the idea is to present a solution but I agree with you that people do want to see something. They don't want to feel like they have to get qualified by some junior person that can't talk to them about their business and then go to the AE in the second meeting and then the third meeting, right? Like it's a, there's some, you know, ideal mix in there. I'm just not sure where it is. Yeah. Well, I think it's really hard to balance. I'm with you. And nobody, nobody does it exactly the same. Um, and I'm de- I'm definitely coming from like the buyer perspective here because I buy a lot of software and I just want to look at it. So it could be misguided from a buyer perspective, but if you can't connect with what that buyer is looking for, at least in some way, 
I think it's a missed opportunity. So the right answer as usual is probably somewhere in the middle. In the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just like how much detail do you, you know, again, if it's a 30 minute call, like there's just not a lot of time to show um, much, but you obviously want to uh, commit to getting them. Yes, I can solve your problem. Like, this goes into the discovery and everything else. It is. That's why I think discovery in those first meetings are the most important to me in a sales process, because if you don't do that right, you set the relationship off on the bad foot. You know, you don't build their trust. You somehow don't give them what they're looking for. That impacts everything else. Like even if it's a good positive relationship, but if I'm just saying, hey, yeah, I can solve your problem. Here's a quote. And I didn't teach you anything. Right. I didn't really try to understand your problems and say, here's exactly the modules that you need to do this, this and this. And here's how. And then somebody else may do that. Like a competitor can teach mm -hmm. them, you know, the ABM basics or whatever they need. That's not technical in nature. And you'll lose that deal later in the funnel because the upfront wasn't done right. So I just anyway, just the business that I'm in with our um, kind of sales engagement technology. I just know how important that's where we're trying to influence things but i don't know it sounds like you're in agreement there just on that yeah well fantastic well um mallory you've been in marketing operations now in revenue operations how did you get into this field yeah so right out of school i started as a marketing analyst um just writing salesforce reports all day and learned a lot from a big crowd at exact target it was a really good first experience mm -hmm. um, stayed connected to a lot of that crew and then did some marketing leadership roles um did a global marketing operations role at cheetah digital where i really got to understand how a bigger business approaches it and um, how a bigger marketing operations team would work and then i have always done some consulting since i started having kids i'd kind of come and go from full-time and consulting and um I got a lot of exposure to sales through sales and marketing alignment, of course. Mm -hmm. And that was always part of my part of my process of, you know, improving marketing outcomes was that tight sales partnership. So I knew enough to be dangerous, but not really enough to hop right into revenue ops. And then when I started consulting with Terminus, the first thing that they wanted some help with was predictability of the sales funnel. And so it wasn't something that I had super deep experience in, but I knew enough to get in there and help out and do the analysis and let them know where things were standing. So that was one of my first projects. And then I joined full time as um, kind of a business analyst. And I was just going to jump in and look at certain things in the business and do special projects and be an individual contributor. Um, did that for a little while and then over time stepped into leading the RevOps team. And so I've been learning a lot along the way, you know, like you mentioned, my background is more marketing than it is sales. So I've been fortunate to learn from great sales leaders that we've had at Terminus and others and lots of research, but um, I like the leap. I like looking at the entire business end to end, trying to help people look around corners and mm -hmm. stay out of each other's way and, and have that alignment across the departments. Well, it seems like, you know, revenue operations is only taking an increasingly important role in, you know, SaaS companies. Um, you know, I don't know if, if this plays in, you know, other service companies or so on, but just in the SaaS universe, like this is becoming an increasingly important, you know, now that it's not just marketing operations and sales operations, they're merging those together. Obviously, it's growing importance. Um, you know, the fact that you now, you know, that your org reports outside of those two, again, just is elevating it, in my opinion. Um and so you've positioned yourself well, right, for uh, for continued growth and and um, um, you know thank you for coming on. Where can we follow you online? You know I I know you're posting a lot of great content on LinkedIn and I thank you for that because I do read it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I I go in spurts. Um, LinkedIn is probably a good spot. I've done a couple of blog posts for the Terminus blog, but pretty heads down a lot of times yep. um, running the business. So. I do it when I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, definitely check out Mallory on LinkedIn. And uh, thanks again for coming on to the Revenue Hustle. It's been great having you. Thanks for sharing your insights. And let's do it again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to the Revenue Hustle. This episode has been brought to you by Nine Lenses. Close more deals with interactive assessments. Check them out at NineLenses.com. See you next time.